Well, we all know that words mean things, right? They have meaning. In fact, one of the ways to win arguments and even alter reality and truth is for people to seek to change the meaning of words. So we often have to go back and define them properly and redefine them. When my boys were younger, I had to define and redefine what the word bath meant for them so that they would make sure and take it properly. Um, I'm also a teacher in a college classroom, and um, I have to define and redefine for my students sometimes what the word deadline means. Think about this on a more serious scope. What about when we change the meaning of the word love or faith or marriage? Changing the meaning of these words can bring great harm. And so we have to go back and sometimes define and redefine what they mean. What about the word Christian? Well, listen, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, is going to go back and he's going to redefine for this church what the Christian life really means, what the word Christian actually means, and how that life is to be lived. Paul is concerned about the meaning and their perversion of that meaning, so he's going to define it and redefine it for them. And the truth is, unless you know how the Christian life is intended to be lived, how it's defined, it can lead to great frustration and failure. In fact, I believe that there are many believers who are living in frustration and failure because they do not understand what is the essence and the nature of the Christian life in the first place. And the Apostle Paul is going to help us with this as we begin this new sermon series called Forever Free. We're going to talk about what it means to live the Christian life. So let's begin by going through some background material. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 6. You can also look at the notes on the church app. Paul is building a case, brick by brick, piece by piece. He is building a case for what it means and what it looks like to be a believer in Christ. So after a brief introduction in chapter 1, he goes on the first three chapters of the book of Romans to talk about the great sinfulness of man, how utterly hopeless we are in our sin, how depraved we are, how bankrupt we are. And he paints a, a profound picture of that. He says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, he says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So he spends the first part of the book of Romans talking about sin and its penalty. And this is important. Because if we're going to understand the Christian life and we're going to understand grace in the Christian life, which is what this series is all about, then we must first come to understand sin. Listen, it's often taboo to talk about sin, even in churches. Well, pastor, I want to feel good. And when you talk about sin, it doesn't make me feel good. Can't we talk about the love of God? not the holiness of God. Can't we talk about the grace of God, not the justice of God? Here's what I want to say. You cannot fully understand the depths of God's love unless you first understand how undeserving you are of that love. In fact, coming to understand God's holiness and justice gives us a greater awareness and a greater appreciation for the grace and love of God. So Paul is setting the stage in these first three chapters. In chapters four and five, he begins to talk about now the doctrine of salvation. That through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, we are saved. We come into relationship with God through Christ. It is through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, that we are saved, that our sins are forgiven, and that we walk in a new relationship with God himself. So, these have been the two themes for the first few chapters, man's sinfulness and God's salvation. Now, as we get to Romans chapter 6... Chapter 6, 7, and 8, Paul is going to begin talking about the Christian life. He's going to be talking about spiritual growth and the holiness of believers. In respect to sin, he's going to talk about the fact that sin is still present. Now listen, he's not talking about the penalty of sin. He's talking about the power of sin. The penalty of sin has been paid by Jesus on the cross. He's still talking about, though, the power of sin at work in our world, the tug of sin, the pull of sin, the temptation of sin that we all face. And so he's going to begin describing the nature of the Christian life. He's going to uh, try to put away misconceptions that people have and help them understand how it is to be lived. So here's really the theme. 
the theme for what we're going to talk about for these next few weeks together is that the Christian life that is lived after salvation is as much a gift of God to the believer as salvation is when it first comes about. It's very important that you understand that. Because we forget that the same Christ who saved us is the same Christ who sanctifies us and causes us to grow spiritually. Our salvation is through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, but the Christian life lived is as well. And again, we forget that. The Christian life in all its aspects is meant to be lived supernaturally in Christ. What it means not just to become a Christian, but to actually live as one. Christ is all in salvation, and Christ is all in our sanctification and our growth. It is impossible, in fact, to live the Christian life without the power of Christ, and yet there are many people who do so. In fact, I would say there is nothing so boring, nothing so pitiful, nothing so exasperating as Christianity without Christ, and yet that is exactly what many believers are indeed seeking to do. What started in faith, our salvation stays only by faith. So Paul wants believers to not just come to Christ, but to grow in him. And that means dealing first and foremost with the problem of sin at work. So he begins with a question. As he starts this treatise about uh, the work of Christ in our life after salvation, he begins with a question in verse 1 of Romans chapter 6. Here's the question. What shall we say then? Based upon all he had said up in these, up to the, this point in the first five chapters, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Now think about that question for a moment. Paul is saying, is it true? The more that I sin, the more there is grace. And there are one of two answers to that question. And by the way, neither of them are correct. One of two answers. In other words... People are always looking for a substitute for grace because grace, in the way that Paul defines it, redefines it, grace is too good to be true. (laughs) And so there's always some kind of substitute that people are looking for in answer to this question. So Paul says, shall we go on sinning so that grace might increase? And there's one group of people that would say, yes, we should. Anything goes. Yes, we can go on sinning because grace will increase. That's an abuse of grace in the believer's life. And there are Christians, there have always been Christians throughout the centuries, even today, who live without any restraints of holiness. And I'm talking about profound sin, incest and greed and prostitution. Again, in the earliest of years, this was true, you name it. God's grace for them meant a free-for-all. It's the ideal, well, you sin on Saturday night because you confess on Sunday. So it doesn't really matter what you do because you get a free pass. And there are people that have that mindset. And there are churches, unfortunately, that teach grace in a way that cheapens it. God expects nothing from us, they say. They make light of God's grace by not connecting God's grace to his holiness. So on one extreme, one side of the spectrum, people would say, yes, we can go on sinning so that grace might increase. But there's another extreme on the other side of the spectrum where people would say, no, nothing goes. No, we cannot keep on sinning that grace might increase. It's a rejection of grace, in other words. No to everything. So this other extreme is extreme legalism. For law and legalism gives a sense of control, doesn't it? But what Paul knew, what Jesus taught, is that law doesn't really bring control. Though self-will and self-effort might control external behavior for a time. But even at some point, we lose the power within ourselves to control all of our sin and temptations in our behavior. But regardless, self-effort might control external behavior, but it does not change the heart. You see, love takes us much more than legalism ever will. So nothing goes is the approach of this group. The nothing goes approach is tempting. Why? Because there are grace abusers today. In response, pastors and churches, because of grace abuse, 
make big rules and lots of tiny ones. Spoken and unspoken codes of conduct in churches. And that which is intended to build culture in church eventually becomes cult. Where everybody must think alike, look alike, act alike. And the standards creep higher and higher and higher. And there is judgmentalism and self-righteousness and legalism. So Paul is going to make a case that there is another option, a third option, a more excellent way. So to the question, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Look in verse 2 now. The answer to that is this. May it never be. I love this phrase. May it never be. It's a Greek phrase where the King James Bible translates it, God forbid, and it's not literally God forbid, or it's not literally may it never be. It's an idiom in the original language. It's the strongest reaction possible. It's an outraged indignation. It's like saying the euphemism, heck no. (laughs) And so Paul is saying, no, this should never be, but he answers the question with another question. Putting the question this way, he is He is saying this, can you really be a believer and continue to remain in, abide in, stay in, and live in the same relationship with sin that you had before Christ? And Paul would say, no, may it never be. But that's not the full answer. Again, the answer to the question is another question. He says here in verse 2, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? So think about the phrase, died to sin. What he's beginning to talk about here is that our relationship to sin has changed because of Christ, because we are now in Christ. And it's not that sin died, but that we died to it. This is foundational in understanding how to walk in Christ and in faith as a believer. The ideal here that Paul is beginning to talk about is that death and life are not compatible. You understand that, right? I mean, you can't be dead and alive at the same time. You all agree with that. It's a logical impossibility. Now, some of you can be alive and still kind of look dead. I mean, I've seen many of you in worship. But nonetheless, it's impossible. You can't really be dead and really be alive at the same time. So it's this fundamental, fundamental logical contradiction for a Christian to be living in, wallowing in, walking in sin when he has died to it. And I know what you're thinking, because the wheels are spinning. Mike, what do you mean? Are you, are you saying that Christians never sin? I did not say that. <laughs> Hold on. I'm just saying what Paul said. So I want to encourage you to be patient as we unpack all of this over these weeks. As the argument unfolds, be patient, because we're going to have some answers, but now there's going to be A lot of questions as well. So he makes this bold statement. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And then he gives an analogy. Look in verses 3 through 5. He gives the analogy of baptism about this new life. Baptism is the symbol of conversion, isn't it? It's a symbol of new life. It's a symbol of positionally that we have moved from one place to the next. That where we were and where we are now is different. That who we were and who we are now is different. And that's the symbol of baptism. So he's beginning to redefine our understanding of the Christian life in itself. So now beginning in verse 6. Paul begins to describe in detail that new position that we have in Jesus. And here's how I think he is describing it. He, first of all, talks about a new relationship. That we have entered into a new relationship. Now, that's church lingo and language, but I want you to really stay here for a moment and get this in your mind. Verses 6 through 7, Paul begins to use language and phrases like, the old self was crucified. Read it there. He says, the old self was crucified. The old self is the former person. That is who you were before Christ. That old self is being crucified. It's what Paul would say also in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So he uses the image of the crucifix to describe what happened to our old self. Now think about the crucifix for a moment. The cross. The crucifix was a place of certain death. 
but not instant death. In fact, it was the opposite of instant death. It was a slow, agonizing, and torturous kind of death. I think this image is applicable when it comes to the death of the old nature, the old self, is that that old nature is in the process of dying, and it takes a while. And there's a process that involves agony and pain and letting go and giving up. This is what it means for the old self to be crucified. He uses the phrase, we are no longer slaves to sin. In other words, he's defining reality for us. He's stating a matter of fact. You no longer are under the, the mastership, the lordship of sin. He says we are freed from sin. It need no longer have power over us. Again, redefine. Now think about this, this new relationship. There was a time in my life where I became a father. I began a relationship that I'd never had before. And a love entered my life that resulted in a pursuit to build a relationship. A new orientation came about in my life. There's an old saying that said, at every child's birth, a parent is also born. I think that's so true and profound. So after the birth of my firstborn, I now identified myself as a father. It defined my life. And I define my life within that context. I made choices and decisions that aligned my thinking and my behaviors with this newly established relationship. It began to be the way that I saw myself. It wasn't just an add-on to my life. It was a redefinition of my life. Now, Christianity and becoming a Christian is the same way, even in a more profound sense, in a deeper way. The new relationship that you have with Jesus is not an add-on. It's how you actually begin to define yourself and see yourself and align yourself to what that means, which is what we're going to talk about in the weeks to come. So you've entered into a new relationship. Secondly, in Christ you have a new resource. This is what he says in verses 8 through 10. Look at verse 8. He says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Paul is saying we must realize what we have within us, within us, within you as a power unlike any other. This is what we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about is the resource of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how we avail ourselves to it, and how we access him in our lives. We must understand that anything that God expects of us in the Christian life, he provides the way for us to live it. Major Ian Thomas, who's a theologian, He says this, I know of nothing so utterly exciting as being a Christian and sharing the very life of Jesus on earth right here and now, being caught up with him into the relentless, invincible purposes of the Almighty God and having available to us all the limitless resources of deity for accomplishing those purposes. He says, can you imagine anything more exciting than that? The Christian life is nothing less than the life which he lived then, which now lives within us so we have a new resource and i'm so excited to be able to talk to you about that resource in the weeks to come and here's the final thing we have a new response we have a new way of responding to sin and its power look in verses 11 through 13 verse 11 paul says consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So consider yourself. The word could be translated, count yourself. In other words, again, define yourself in this way. Believe this about yourself. Believe about yourself that you are dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Bring your mind into alignment with this reality. Again, going back to the analogy of being a father, I would never not think of myself as a father now. Because being a father is not what I do. It is about who I am. This is much more true about the Christian life because what God did in us is he replaced our old self with a new nature and a new self. So Paul is saying, count yourself this way. Consider yourself this way. Think this way. uh, Know yourself this way. Count this to be true about yourself. The old nature begins to tell us that we're not Christians. The old nature cries out that we don't have the power of Christ, that there is no victory. But Paul says, no, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. And then he says, present yourselves. But first in verse 12, look at verse 12. Therefore, based upon what he had just said about what you are to believe and consider about yourself, 
He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evils, evil desires. You say, okay, Paul, I won't, but how? Well, consider yourself and the next present yourself. Offer yourself. This is the next phrase that is used in verse 13. And it's used two times. One in the negative. Paul says in verse 13, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. This is very practical. The word present there literally means to stand near. So Paul is saying, do not stand near sin. Do not present yourself and the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness. Don't stand near sin. That's proximity. Don't go near it. Flee from it. Stay away from it. I told my kids growing up that if they put themselves in losing situations, they are likely to lose. And Jesus said it even more radically than this. Jesus said, listen, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. He says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Jesus is saying, deal radically with sin, which means that in the matter of proximity to sin, it means that we might need to change friendships or we might need to change the computer and the TV and do something different in our lives rather than presenting ourselves and exposing ourselves to that which is harmful to us. So he says, don't do that. But now in the positive, verse 13, but do, however, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members of instruments of righteousness to God. So do not stand near sin, but do stand near the things of God. Paul is saying very practically, starve the one, feed the other. The one that you feed grows strong. The one that you don't feed grows weak. So the question is, what are you feeding? What are you getting near to? So count yourselves. This is a matter of the mind. Believe it and then present yourselves. It's a matter of how you behave. Behave like it. And then he makes a summary statement in verse 14. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. There it is. There is reality for you and me as believers. We do not have to live as slaves to sin. We do not have to live as victims. We must believe it and we must live like that. And when you fall and when you fail and you will, trust again and again in the grace of God that brings about that victory in your life. So here are some summary statements that define and redefine for us what it means to be a Christian. First thing is this. Being a Christian, we've got to understand this. Being a Christian is not believing something new. It is becoming someone new. You get that? Paul says, 1 Corinthians 5, that those who are in Christ are new creations. The old has passed away. The new has come. So being a Christian is not exchanging one set of beliefs for another. It's not adopting a moral code. It's not committing myself to a certain lifestyle. That's religion. Being a Christian is being new, being brand new, and he's become something as a Christian that he was never, ever before. It's not an addition. It's a transformation. And it's a transformation that God has done for us and in us. Secondly, being a Christian means that we have died to sin in our new nature. So sin is no longer the abiding power in our life. Does that mean that sin has gone away. I'm not saying that. Does that mean there will be no more temptation? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that sin, based upon what Christ has done, is not the ruling power and the abiding power in our lives anymore. So you must, by faith, claim that and believe that and define yourself in that way. And we're going to talk about the power of grace and how it's applied in the weeks to come. And then the final statement here is this. All of this that I've just described, is more than something that God says about us. It's something that God did for us. So what God did and what he does for us is going to be a major theme in the weeks ahead. And here's what I just want to do today as we close. I want to ask you, what do you believe about yourself? How are you, how are you defining who you are. Because the truth is, there may be some of you who are struggling with sin because you haven't settled that matter. You're kind of straddling the fence. You're one of the best of both worlds. 
You've not given yourself fully to Christ. You've not made up your mind fully about whether you're going to follow Jesus and bow at his feet and walk in his ways and be who God has said you should be and be who God has made you to be as a believer. And as long as you are undecided about that, as long as you're just a little murky about what it means to be a Christian, you're going to forever deal with frustration and with failure. And you're going to do so in a way that makes you a victim of the power of sin. Listen, there is a greater power at work within us. We're going to talk about that greater power. But for you, you have to decide first. You have to consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. And then because of that belief and that reality, then you have to present yourself and offer yourself. The members of your body, as Paul would say, as instruments of righteousness, not unrighteousness. So what are you feeding? What are you starving? What are you getting up next to? And how is that impacting your life in Christ? So my encouragement to you today as we start this new sermon series is simply this. Begin to define yourself as God intends. Begin to define yourself as a believer, in the way the Bible does, the way God does, that you are a new creation in Christ. And to believe and consider the fact that you are no longer under the slavery of sin, but you've been set free, died to it. And as you have died to it, Christ now makes you alive together with him. Hold on to that. And as we proceed in the weeks to come, I think it's going to make more sense in how to live it. So let's bow in prayer. Let's let's ask God to, um, to just help his truth to transform us and be applied to our lives. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, for uh, the fact that there is a work in us that is beyond us. Thank you, Father, that the Christian life is not to be lived in our own will and in our own power, in our own strength, in our own effort. But that anything that is to take place in our life from the standpoint of holiness and sanctification will be the result of grace and mercy and love and will be the result of the supernatural work of Christ within us. So help us, Father, not to try harder, but instead help us, Father, to have more faith to trust you to do in us what we could never, ever do for ourselves when it comes to this matter of sin. So as we begin this series, Father, I pray that you would seal deep in the hearts of those who are listening right now the reality of who they are in Christ, that they would begin to define themselves as you define them, see themselves as you see them, as those who are in Christ. And that Jesus is making the difference to give us the power, the greater power, over the power and the temptation of sin. So as we move forward in this series, God, bless it, use it, and I pray that each and every one of us would fall into grace and understand in deep, profound ways how it applies to our lives. We trust you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.